Yes. So, um, hello. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Sarah Chapman, um, and I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Media Burn Archive, which is based in Chicago. Media Burn collects, produces, and distributes documentary video produced by artists, activists, and community groups. Our mission is to use archival media to deepen context and encourage critical thought through a social justice lens. This is the seventh event in our series of virtual talks with video activists. Um, if you enjoy today's event and want to catch up on some that you missed, um, many but not all of the events are streaming on our website. And I think there's going to be a link uh, posted in the chat soon to that. Yep, there we go. Um, we hope you can also join us for some exciting programs this fall, including with Bombozilla, a video activist group and streaming platform doing incredible work in Brazil. Um, Chicago-based video artist and Beyond Media founder Salome Chaznoff. Um, Engage Media, who have been documenting frontline journalists during COVID in the Philippines. The Southside Home Movie Project, created by Jacqueline Stewart and hosted at the University of Chicago, as well as filmmaker and co-founder of the feminist media journal Jump Cut, Julia LaSage. Uh, cat, cat here. <laughs> Thanks so much um, to those of you who, cho who chose to include a donation with your registration. Um, your support truly means a lot to us and to our ability to continue programming like this. If you're new to our organization and you are inspired during the event to donate, you can do so by texting MEDIABURN, M-E-D-I-A-B-U-R-N, to 44321. Um, today, we're pleased to present a screening and discussion with Nancy Buchanan. Nancy is a conceptual artist working in many forms. Her performance work began in 1972 when she was a member of the infamous F Space Gallery in Santa Ana, California, where Chris Burden performed Shoot. Her earliest videotapes were recorded on open reel porta packs, and she has produced installations, drawings, and mixed media work. Buchanan owned a portable video system with artists Paul McCarthy and John Duncan, which she often used alongside other artists. She assisted activist Michael Zinzoon with his cable access program, Message to the Grassroots, from 1988 to 1998. She also traveled to Namibia and documented that country's independence from South Africa. Buchanan was honored to visit Media Burn, well, we were honored <laughs> to have her visit Media Burn in 2019 to screen some of Michael's programs in Chicago. She enjoys learning technology and had two residencies at the Experimental Television Center established by Ralph Hocking in upstate New York. There she used a color synth synthesizer developed by Namjoon Paik and Shuye Abe and several other image processing tools. She taught video at CalArts from 1988 until her retirement in 2012. She's going to screen five pieces created between 1979 and 2008. There will be time between each piece for discussion, so please feel free to put your comments in the chat or unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, I'll keep an eye for people waving um, who want me to unmute them, um, and we hope it can be a pretty interactive um, discussion. Um, so um, I will bring on Nancy to um, say a few words, and then we can screen the first piece. Um, so I'm so glad to be here, and um, I really hope that people will visit the Media Burn archive and see some of the amazing videos that are available for you to see for free. And please also look at the bios of the very modest people running this incredible place. Tom Weinberg is like a pioneer in activism and video, and um, Sarah also has done some amazing things, including um, a collaboration with um, Russian artists recently. So um, my first, my very first videos, I'm not going to show you because most of them were performance documentation and they seem a little slow now and they're not really appropriate. So um, the very first piece um, was completed in 1979 when uh, I, I had that portable equipment that Sarah mentioned. It was a, a, a huge boxy color camera and um, a three quarter inch portable so-called videotape deck. And I made this short work for um, a series that was organized by Kathy Ray Huffman, who I think is here if she wants to say anything after we look at it. And uh, Kathy, had the brilliant idea of asking video artists to make works that were either 30 seconds or 60 seconds for a project called 30 Second TV Art. 
And um, the idea, as I remember it anyway, was that eventually they would be shown on TV, but actually it's very ironic that the only one that was ever shown on, on television, broadcast television, was a work by Mitchell Sarup, and it was um, shot on film. So <laughs> the, rest, the rest of them were um, seen in various art venues. And uh, so uh, I thought of it as a way to make a kind of a, an anti-advertisement. So let's watch these creatures. Isn't it amazing that they can get up each morning, that they can actually drive cars, go to the supermarket, read street signs, operate appliances, vote in elections, blow their children's noses. These creatures with teeth that tear flesh, mouths that make sounds, isn't it amazing that we allow them to live among us, these creatures that we can and do control? What secrets do they possess? What allows them to function without violence? Are they secretly violent? So, um, something else that perhaps some people don't know about the history of video art is that the very small at that time Long Beach Museum was um, a very important uh, place for video art and uh, showed video artists from all over the world. It had actually been a small craftsman house. And so it was really like kind of the perfect um, venue for televisions, installations of TVs and, um, uh, you know, soft pillows you could lie on. And uh, so, um, that was that was uh, where Kathy Ray Huffman was uh, working when she programmed this this particular um, series. Um, also, I'd like to just mention that um, Cindy Ream uh, this past year um, created a um, uh, a uh, show of women artists that was called These Creatures, and um, I'll put the link to the uh, museum where you can um, you can actually look at the uh, catalog from that that show and I think Cindy is is here so she might say something about that are there any questions or comments from anybody hello <laughs> Have Cindy or Kathy one doesn't feel too put on the spot. Um. Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, these were really exciting times. Um, we were full of ourselves and wanted to break into, you know, this public medium and even having the programs, um, uh, the museum, we made a um, cable TV program that the museum regularly put on. Of course, they played it over and over again, like it was <laughs> a constant stream of the same program. But they did show this TV spots, and um, it was a way to get artists to come together and work on a theme. And, you know, not too many of those kinds of commissioning options have been started uh, up until then, where, you know, just come and do what you want. Here's the equipment. Here's the tech support. Go for it. So it was a lot of fun for us all, and we, we knew we were doing something that um, was very unusual at the time. When was it? 1978? Yeah. Yeah, that was, I guess, well, my piece was finished in 79, I guess. Oh, it went over it sometime, yeah. It take, there were quite a number of artists, so, you know, it took time to get everybody in the studio and get their editing times and stuff like that. There, there were some residencies for um, artists at some of the 
educational television stations, but they tended to be the, the heavy hitters. You know, right. Melvin and um, I think uh, Richard Serra and, uh, you know, not too many women, a few, but not too many. And so in Long Beach, it was really a great, a great opportunity. Um, and just to say a little about this, this um, video of mine, I think that um, looking back on most of my work, um, I have always um, been interested in asking questions and then seeing what kinds of things I can kind of trace and figure out um, from that process. So in this one, I think it's pretty obvious um, what I was thinking about. I think Sherry wanted to say something. Yeah, I actually did want you to talk more about the content. Um, you know, you're obviously uh, riffing on um, advertising about women and beauty and products and all those things. And, um, you, you know, I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what were the ads at the time, the television ads and the ways women were being portrayed in the media that you were responding to. And then I love this underlying question about are they secretly violent? You know, <laughs> and like what talk, I just want you to talk more about the content of the piece, please. Yeah, yeah well, um, the question for me really wasn't, um, didn't come from the advertising. It came from this very deep, uh, just feeling disturbed about violence against women. You know, I had participated in, oh, what a cutie, uh, Suzanne Lacey's um, Three Weeks in May and you know, shot video there, and there'd been the Hillside Strangler case, and um, the burning question for me was, how are such acts possible? It must be that women aren't human beings, that they, they just aren't in the same realm as, as men, and so that was, that was really what inspired the piece and then I wanted every shot to have the makeup wrong <laughs> you know the blue tongue and um, you know the eyes on the eyelids and the the green uh, mm -hmm. face cream so there's something wrong in in every shot and then of course the bone roses that uh, she takes out at the end Do we want to move on to the next piece? Sure. Um, I believe it is tech knowledge. Mm -hmm. I am not going to mystify it, but I'm not going to explain it either. I am looking and thinking about the potential for understanding how we move through this so-called post-industrial life and how circumscribed our understanding is. There are so many things one could learn, try to remember, analyze, and yet the opportunity for assuming control is there as much as the ability to flip on a switch, stretch out an arm. Technology is a very difficult thing to visualize. You, know, you think of what it would be like if you were sitting in Hawaii in the, in, before Captain Cook got there and all of a sudden for some reason a typewriter dropped on the island and you came out and you looked at this typewriter and you said, huh? And yet, you know, that typewriter is full of information. I mean, you could, by taking that thing apart and putting it back together, you could, you know, eventually sort of figure out what it was. It's just that any technician built into technology presupposes values and value judgments a technology that we're all familiar with and that we can sort of talk about is the automobile. Probably the most major value involved in automobile technology is the sense that we can all use it individually, but it's produced at very specific uh, sites in the country. Um, and when you think about that, it means that we all have use or control over it at a certain point in our lives, but at another point in the actual production of it, we don't. The technology has other values, and those values are things like the use of fossil fuels, which perhaps if we had choices in the development of uh, automobile technology, we would choose some other fuel that doesn't pollute the environment. The, uh, the U.S. 
farm population is less than 3% of the total population. 5% 5 receive, produce half, and 1% receive two-thirds of all the money that's out there to be had. 1% of the farmer. That leaves every other farmer, that 99% out there scrapping for that one-third. Two years ago, Freddie, our boy, he decided he wanted to stay on the farm, so he added 10 more cows to the herd and put in a pipeline and bigger cooler and everything. It sure is a lot more simpler now, and it's milk cows and a lot easier too. You don't have to carry any milk anymore, you just hang the machine on the cow and it goes into a pipeline and it sucks it right on into the cooler. And we've got a machine where there's a little uh, automatic button on there, when the cow is done it, the button just goes up and you just take the machine off. It isn't supposed to hurt the cows that way. Okay, we've got 160 acres of land and we've got uh, 26,000 laying hens. And uh, they're in two different buildings. We've got one that's uh, 40 foot wide and 336 feet long. And then we've got a barn that's converted over the downstairs with cages in it. And uh, all the birds are in cages. And we've got automatic feeders and automatic waters. And uh, automatic egg belts that bring the eggs to the end of the row. And then all we have to do is pick them off from the tables on the end and pack them into cases. Can technology used on a small scale, such as an individual family or group cooperative, still be effective? Herbert Marcuse said, Technology is a mode of production, as the totality of instruments, devices, and contrivances which characterize the machine age is at the same time a mode of organizing and perpetuating or changing social relationships, a manifestation of prevalent thought and behavior patterns, an instrument for control and domination. Okay, Nancy, what you're seeing here are Food Machinery Corporation high-density green bean harvesters. Uh, these machines are new last year. Uh, the four that you see working here would replace uh, eight to ten of the old conventional two-row type green bean harvesters. Uh, this design of harvester is the state-of-the-art, the newest uh, type green bean harvesting equipment. The purpose of this machine is that it will take more than two rows, it will harvest more than two rows at one time and the principal operating parts of the machine are the picking reel in front which strips the green beans from the plant, uh, the fans, the suction fans on the machine which clean the debris, the leaves and stems, extraneous material away from the bean pods, uh, blows the extraneous material out on the side and as you can see in the tanks the green beans are then elevated up into the tanks. When the tanks are full uh, they're raised hydraulically and dumped into either a semi type truck or a straight truck. Which our agriculture department, which covers quite a large area of the state of Wisconsin, encompasses about 40,000 acres of vegetable crops. These crops are principally contracted with local growers. Uh, it seems there, there's a tremendous inequity, but it just goes to the efficiencies of scales. The larger, you know, the big fish eat, eat bigger fish. It just keeps growing. So for some, somebody that wants to be involved in agriculture on a small basis, they're, uh, they're really foolish. They're absolutely foolish to get involved in it. If they've got any expertise in any other area, so when you think of it, when you think of it in, the, in those terms, uh, you just can't get too excited about agriculture. Marx makes a distinction between um, capital, well, between labor and dead labor. Right? Uh, a human labor is an intrinsically human activity. Right? It's a person doing something to nature. It, nothing in nature has value unless it is either noticed by or transformed by human beings. Right, and that process of human consciousness interacting with the environment is in fact labor. Right? You can build a machine that will do the same work as a human being, but that process is dead labor because what in fact the labor in there is nothing more than what was created when that product was interacted upon by humans. The basic uh, making of beer itself hasn't changed drastically uh, throughout the years. The uh, equipment that you're using has changed, but the process itself is a biochemical reaction. You're utilizing yeast, and you're at the mercy of uh, an actual biological process. And so that's no real change at all. Uh, however, the, the speed at which you can do it because of advanced machinery and, and things of that nature will help an awful lot, but 
there is no real change in the making of beer over, well, over the centuries, really. I know 21 years ago when I started, we had seven, 179 different brewing companies in this country. And right now we're down into the 30s. Uh, it's, it's really a fascinating thing how some have grown and others have just fallen by the wayside. Uh, some that you would not believe would fall by the wayside because they had tremendous facilities 10, 15, 20 years ago. I mean, there's a, there's a wonderful contradiction in, in capitalism. Uh, if you go back and, and, and read Marx, uh, Marx thought that information was free. And so, in fact, did the capitalists at that point think that information was free. In fact, the whole magic trick of capitalism is to take a uh, social process, that is to say, people interacting, and to convert it into a plan that is the property of management. Information is a pattern, right? There are three elements in the universe. There's matter, energy, and the way those things were arranged, and the way they are arranged is information, right? The way people are arranged is information, and control of that information is the determination of how the society is going to run, right? And so the, 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 the right of the manager to say, you will do this, and you will do that, and you will do that, and I will collect the profits, rather than saying, you will sell to you, and you will sell to you, and you will sell to you, the way that I sell to my customers and you will all take your own profit. The fact that he managed, the managers managed to pull that off was in fact control of information, and control of information is the essence of capitalism. Thank you for dialing TRW's 900 number to make the longest long distance telephone call in history. The Pioneer 10 spacecraft, built for NASA by a company called TRW, is transmitting these signals to Earth from 2.8 billion miles in space as it begins to leave our solar system. Traveling at the speed of light, this data takes over four hours to reach Earth-bound tracking antennas. Today, we receive the signal as an inaudible impulse at 20 trillionths of a watt. This taped transmission has then been slowed electronically allow you to recognize the voice of our first spacecraft to the star. We hooked up to the entire world. Um, libraries in every country, access to your, uh, to the information and the power that your house is using at that point. Um, entertainment, of course. Uh, software for your computer. Um, all of these things could be delivered cheaply and uh, rapidly and absolutely accurately through the cable. There's, there's just nothing else like it in, in, in its ability to carry a very broad band and therefore uh, a lot of information. But the question is whether it will be used for that or not <clears throat> and what the expense will be and therefore who will have access to it. Uh, there could very easily be a real stranglehold over all this information and the delivery system itself and mankind I would not say has had a good track record on um, what he does with a product or a service once the stranglehold is there. Um, actually I think the electronic game in industry is very good for the electronic industry overall since most of the games are the most up-to-date in electronic technology. Uh, Integrated circuitry is used extensively in each of the games. The type of people we get in here are basically families and uh, mostly teenagers from the ages of uh, 12 on up to 18 as uh, takes up about 75 percent of our business. So the game industry next is going to uh, holographic games, which is laser games, three-dimensional type of games. Uh, Okay, they've replaced our muscles and now computers replace our minds. We have nothing left but our feelings. And then I see somebody watching TV, right? And they're feeling what this box is doing to them. You know, so what's left? What's left? What hasn't been amputated? What hasn't been technologized? As Mark said, you know, you confront the machine doing everything that you have done. A lot of my life is like watching the Minutemen take off. I turn on the evening news and I say, oh, there they go. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's feeling like that. This is out of my hands. But the thing is that the, the fact is that all of that stuff that is out of my hands is 
theoretically being done in my name. Project ELF is an antenna system that the Navy would like to build in northern Wisconsin and the upper peninsula of Michigan. It would be used for communications with submarines, and ELF stands for Extremely Low Frequency Non-Ionizing Radiation. This is what would be used for communications with the subs because at such low frequencies, radio waves can penetrate the ocean at greater depths than current communication systems are capable of. The system is vulnerable. What it is is cable strung up on something similar to telephone poles in the National Forest of Wisconsin. And that cable is very vulnerable, not just to any sort of saboteurs, but also to trees falling on it and lightning bolts striking it. All the tools that you have on hand are corrupt. All the tools that you have on hand are um, technologized. Everything that you are wearing is army surplus in one way or another. Everything that you are using is army surplus in one way or another. So you say now, that, all right, so I admit it. I am sitting here in an army surplus depot, and the question is, can I use some of this stuff to, you know, like ET, can I take the speak and spell and put it together with the umbrella? And, you know, and can I somehow, you know, get out of this? The determining factor is not the technology. The determining factor is whether we have the patience and will and uh, hope uh, to be able to use that technology. Vacuum cleaner, toaster, refrigerator, stereo, washing machine, telephone, percolator, lawnmower, microwave, flashlight, typewriter, food processor, air conditioner, waffle iron, hair dryer, garbage disposal, television, garbage Okay, so um, I guess obviously at that time I was living in Wisconsin and I was teaching at uh, the university and I was interested in the residencies provided by the Experimental T Television Center, which Ralph um, Hawking um, started in 1969. Um, or I guess he started in 1971, and it was this amazing place where um, there were a variety of analog tools that you could use to um, manipulate the video signal. And I uh, asked them for the technical manuals, which I received before going there and I read, but I still didn't really have a clear sense of, of what some of the possibilities would be. So I thought, well, if I deal with technology as a theme, then uh, I can treat every part, every little section of the video with some of these tools and make kind of a visual comment on the content. And um, it's interesting to me, I mean, it's an old piece, right? But it seems like some of these questions are still um, pretty uh, important and, and relevant to us today, some things have changed. I mean, look at, the, look at the beer industry. It went back into the craft small beer companies. Also with um, the technology used in farming, there's been a tremendous movement against um, equipment that is uh, cruel to animals. Uh, most people would prefer to buy um, uh, free-range eggs rather than getting them from a place where all the chickens are cooped up for 24 hours a day. Um, 
also, um, I looked up Project ELF and it actually sort of was built and then it was uh, shut down um, in um, 2004. And just the other day, there was an, um, a news story about whales that were beaching uh, in Australia. And a lot of animal activists feel that it is the extreme low frequency that often military uh, groups use in the oceans that causes this kind of terrible event. So those were just a few of the things that, that I was thinking of um, looking at this. And I, I put a link to the, um, oops, oh no, I wanted it to everybody, to everyone. Ah, everyone, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, there's the Experimental Television Center. And um, there, uh, Ralph and Sherry Hawking uh, closed down the Experimental Television Center uh, a few years ago, but um, some of the younger people that were excited about using it have started a new version called Signal Culture. And they do the same thing. They provide absolutely free of charge uh, residencies to people to build tools or process uh, imagery. And it's now located in Boulder, Colorado, where they teach. I'll put that one up too. Um, let's see if I can find it. Ah. Yeah, and I know their archive has, has been donated to Cornell University, who are hopefully going to start making some of that available. I know it's thousands of tapes mm -hmm. that were produced there over the years. Oh. Um, one thing that I was also interested in was your collaboration with the, um, the sound artist who did the soundtrack. I invited Peter Chamberlain um, to come and his, his daughter, um, Iris, who's the baby, um, was uh, uh, now, now performs with her dad. He teaches at the University of Hawaii and is still very interested in doing this kind of work and is very involved in um, process. It's very, very important to him to sort of work with things that are scores when he does his work. So I don't know if he's here. I, I haven't seen his name. So maybe, maybe he couldn't, couldn't make it. But um, you can uh, look him up. I'm not sure that I copied down his link, um, but he's he's certainly easy to find, and um, yeah. So, any any questions about the work or comments that I can answer? Yeah, Mirko, um, you gotta. I sent you a request to unmute, but I think you gotta push the button. There we go. Of course. Thank you. Uh, I, I thought it was a wonderful piece. Um, uh, it's reminiscent of the paintings I saw every day as a high school kid. I went to Lane Tech High School in Chicago, and on the first floor we had WPA paintings. And this, your video is reminiscent of those paintings. They, they were a series of working and technology of that era um, along the long high uh, hallways of Lane Tech. And I feel that this video is reminiscent of that, but of the 80s rather than the 30s and 40s. Um, but I have a question. Were those the voiceovers, were they also recorded visually? I went around with a Nagra, a reel-to-reel -reel audio tape recorder. And I shot all of my audio separately. And the, the editing process was, was quite involved. Um, because it was limited, right? It was, it was, you know, tape to tape and you couldn't do dissolve. So I had to like trick the whole system by putting a camera on a monitor and things like that. But I edited the entire soundtrack first and then I timed all the video excerpts to that. So it was a, it was a two part, two part process that way. Yeah. I went to a lot of farmers markets and um, uh, recorded 
some stuff there. And then of course the people that went out with me in the fields, I'd also wanted to go to, um, uh, to an auto plant, but they wouldn't let me come. They were gun shy. <laughs> they thought I would, you know, make too severe a critique. Anything else? Anybody? Thoughts? Questions? No? Okay, well, we can move on to the next one. And at the end, we'll have time to. Oh, no, I see. Um, yes, question again. Can you hear me? Yeah. I just have a question about uh, I'm interested in how you take this nonfiction material and then process it and change the palette and. and and like, what, what was the idea behind, you know, doing that? Like manipulating the image that the camera's recording and turning it into this kind of like graphic image with this, this palette that like d divorces it from its thing, but then also connects it to what you're talking about in the voiceover. Well, one of, one of, that's a good question. One of the things that I felt about video from it's the very early days I was working with it, especially color video, was that it's not reality, you know, and people give it so much power. Television, you know, especially I think before had so much power. And uh, I wanted to emphasize the fact that, you know, this is, this is an image. And also that our lives are so mediated by so many devices that we use without thinking of them. Everything is, technology is tool making. It's everything is a tool. And so I thought I would just put this in front of you so you couldn't forget <laughs> that it was, you know, that it was all technologized as Timothy Haight said. And, um, yeah, and some of the old footage I wanted to mention, I, I shot off a um, flatbed at the, uh, uh, the Historical Society uh, in Madison. They were very kind to let me do that. And that's the cranberry harvesting and the boxes and the old cars and things like that. So I hope that makes sense anyway. Okay. Andrew Newman, uh, notes that Signal Culture will relocate to Fort Collins, Colorado in another year or so. Oh, just as a note. Okay. Do, okay, do we want to move on to um, Fragment? Yeah. Great. Okay, so what should we start with first? Do we have to be deep before we eat? We're good bourgeois people. plug people into it and technology takes over. People come in here and they're inserted into this kind of uh, uh, world view that's uh, easily accessible. Everyone's history is available for purchase and for uh, enjoyment. And I mean, we just, you just got through photographing this plaque on the American Humane Association, uh, thanking Disneyland for what they've done for all peoples. But in truth, uh, there's only one humaneness here, and that's America's notion of it. And that is the humaneness of the commodity. And uh, you know, the best part is that we can buy it. It's our, our history that becomes everyone's history. It's always uh, uh, our notions, our representations, our stereotypes, and that's it. And we have a little holiday treat for you folks. Over there, the shower, that's our singing elephant. That's Harry Elefante. No, no, folks. 
Yeah. He said Safari had dropped off last week. <laughs> Looks like they've become involved in some sort of media. If we think about it, just, you know, you can think about it in, in a very plain, in very plain terms. These are stereotypes that are largely, most of the time, offensive to people. And you can wear that. You know, how, how is it that all these different kinds of people can come in and, uh, and, and, you know, put themselves through the situation where if these were presented to them in the institution, they would be offended. If, they were, if these were presented to them in television, they would be offended. So what is it that drives Disneyland and makes it different? And uh, it has to be the homogenizing effect. But uh, we do this elsewhere, Nancy, it's getting a little tense here. A little bit of footage of the uh, parking lot. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Setting soon. Ah, well. The West is everywhere. I mean, Elias Khoury, the Palestinian writer in Beirut, says, you know, people want to think that Khomeini or Abu Nidal are going back to ancient Islam for what they're doing. No, they have become complete technological products. They have been knit into a temporality that was uniquely not their own and a temporality that was, uh, you know, completely consumed with the hom homogeneity, with a universalizing drive, and uh, this is what you get. Now, there's a lot of power in that, but on the other hand, there's a lot of danger with it, too. Okay, um, Amelia had a good question. Is the video intended to be super pixelated? And yes, um, my idea was that we can recognize Disneyland just from the, you know, just from a few clues. We all know exactly, you know, what's there. And so we don't really need to see it. And again, it was another kind of um, distancing um, thing that I wanted to do, except for the, uh, the racist native uprising, which is clear, so you can see this amazing, you know, they would never get away with that now, but that was, that was the, you know, the tour guide talking at the time, and um, Kitty Millett is here, I believe, I believe she's still here. She is, um, she is the chair of um, the Jewish Studies program at San Francisco State University, and she is a wonderful explicator. And um, she agreed to come to Disneyland if, um, if I would uh, take her on the Matterhorn and other rides that she wanted to see. <laughs> but um, again, I, 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 I sort of feel like, um, in a way, this is contemporary, because it is like this American bullying model of being the best has morphed into something unbelievable these days. So maybe it's not as funny as it used to be. I think Nora has a question or comment. Oh, you're unmuting me. Yeah. Hey, Nancy. Um, and I've seen a lot of your work. I've never seen that. And uh, I just finished a, like a five hour course where we were among other things talking about um, uh, visual metaphors. And I just thought this is, I, I would like to borrow this because I think this is such an elegant visual metaphor for the loss of detail that that's part of, <clears throat> excuse me, I've been speaking for five hours to a class, <laughs> but it's part of um, it, the beauty of that, uh, of, knowing that we're in Disneyland and there's no detail, there's no history, there's just sort of the flat pixelated um, imagery that yes, we recognize, but there's no history behind anything. It's all flattened and fed to us in these little palatable squares. And so I just think it, it's such a elegant uh, um, description and I, it's, definitely timely and unfortunately so much from 50 years ago <laughs> is rearing its ugly head now because we've never dealt with it entirely it's time but um but anyway 
great piece and and might want to use a piece of it in my next sure. All right. <laughs> great. Thank you. Things will be available online for people to see uh, later. Um, I guess we're kind of running out of time, so I'm wondering if we should jump forward now, if, unless somebody has something to say. Kitty, would you like to say anything? Kitty Millett? Yeah. Uh, hi, Nancy. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen that for a while. And so, um, but uh, yes, it, it is timely and it is uh, such an important piece. I'm going to cede this over to you, though, because truthfully, it's your evening uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work. Okay. Um, well, I did have two more works, but maybe we should just skip to the last one because I don't want to um, overstep my invitation and run, run late. So... Um, Maybe we could play um, Flight. Okay. Which is my most recent one that I have in the program. The Now the thing is, you see, the husband says that she was unfaithful. And the media kept asking me, do you think she was unfaithful? Uh, you know, when we had the press conference, and I said, look, I'm not interested whether she was unfaithful or not. I don't really care how many men she went with. All I'm interested in is that she's a human being, and she asked for protection, and we did not pro protect her. And uh, now she, <laughs> she married with uh, man, a man, an old man. Mm -hmm. And Sad. She has now four children and she She's waits pregnant? for pregnant, yeah. Okay. She waits mm -hmm. for another one. And she says <laughs> my, my man my man threw me out out outside. Threw me outside. This journalist that was killed. They they asked her to go to the shelter. She said, I'm not going to go there. It's like prison. لبر آوا دابو نری تکر لیه زور زور یعنی بلین قرستر وکو کمالگاهی که عشایری زرای لبر آوا سیر کی امانه زور جر ترور کردن یعنی هیوا ها بله نتیجه دز رژی مثلا بلین سی بو بیا وشون بو میاری نماوا آموزه کسی خویان مثلا بلین هنی مالی میاد دکی just imagine if you have by the end of the year you have a whole cemetery full of women who've been killed and not claimed wouldn't that raise awareness but now you just have numbers in the paper and you forget about it this last week was 10 this week was two who who's counting nobody's counting it doesn't matter but when you have them in one place i think it, it might just shock some of us uh, مثلا ایوان هیا بنزین که کرا و بسیاری از سوییان را، ایوان پشتیش کرا و لع هالگرت نشته قرص.
This piece uh, kind of um, brings us back to the first one in a way. Um, and the, the performance was by Anne Bean, who um, was um, walking with uh, weather balloons with harmonicas in the, in the mouthpiece. So she was singing and, and um, accompanying the action of the women who were cutting the flowers from the Kurdish dresses and then the balloons would go up in, in remembrance. Um, and I, I put up uh, uh, the, the art roll link and thank you for the link to Ibraz. That's great. So any any last comments, questions? Hi, yeah, thanks. That was a beautiful piece. I mean, it's just it was so touching and so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I mean, sadly beautiful, you know. Did you feel like, how, I mean, did the women who are working in this oh, show? I think I just was on live, I hope not. Um, was, anyway, so the, the women that worked with you there, uh, they, I mean, did they feel threatened to even be doing this? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I mean, we were mainly in the larger cities, Erbil and Suleimania. Um, and um, uh, Choman Hardy was talking about this, this professional woman who was killed by her husband after mm -hmm. she left him. Um, so that was something that, um, uh, that was happening on a, on a regular basis. Um, and um, I decided that I would, I would simply ask women, okay, so now Kurdistan is, is a kind of liberated area do you feel free? And these are the things, these are the issues and the problems that people discuss with me. Yeah. Um, wow. It was Come good. On. Thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. So this is great to see this, you know, this, this, I'm sorry, I was late. And to see more, I'd like, maybe you could do part two of your work. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, in the chat, Michael Ned Holty asks, um, Nancy, could you speak to your relationship to collaboration? I know it's a big question, but it seems like a consistent interest and tactic in your career. Well, it's, it's, been, um, it's been wonderful to, to collaborate for the most part um, over the years, and especially when somebody has a connection to a community that I'm that I'm not really deeply involved with, um, you know my my collaboration with with Michael Zinson. I think of it more as I was just helping him. It was really all his work. Um, but um, I guess um, inviting Kitty to collaborate with her knowledge, 
you know, was um, something I couldn't have done. I couldn't, I couldn't have provided that kind of analysis that she did. And um, when Anne Bean did this performance, um, there were so many other people shooting it with all sorts of cameras. I had to like really be a contortionist to not get too many cameras in my in my video, but it turned out that nobody else had really edited together anything afterwards. So um, so I was happy to to provide at least a short documentation of that amazing piece that she did, and I'm very grateful to her for letting me include it in the video. There's also a longer version of um, the documentary. It's half an hour with a lot oh, wow. more information. Is it on me? Is it on media brain? I mean, how do we see it? It's not. Um, oh. <laughs> well, yeah, I I wasn't completely happy with it, so I should probably oh, revisit it. You know, I thought eh, it's going slowly here and there, so. Maybe it's done. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kitty had asked a follow-up question um, related to Michael's question. Um, could you characterize where you're going now in your work? I'm drawing and making things. <laughs> um, I, I did go to Signal Culture um, last last September, and I, I took a I took video again to to process. But somehow I I just haven't. I I feel like. The moving image now is such a different thing. And um, I, I don't feel that that is something that I have a voice for right now. Um, and I really like sort of the, just the private activity of just making things. And I just uh, closed an exhibit at Charlie James Gallery here in LA of drawings and other things. So um, I don't know if I'll make any more video ever again. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. I've always been drawing, so um, I can put up the link to Charlie James. I think so. If people are interested, you can you can you can see the the little. Um, oh, no, I guess I didn't. Oh, here it is. Here it is. Um, most of the show was about hair. Um, uh, and, uh, oops, how do I say everyone? Yeah, okay. So the title was Crowning Glories. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I worked with hair in my early performance work and some installations and over the years I've gone back to it again and again as like this human product that I'm really fascinated with. So. But thank you so much for inviting me to do this. I, I really enjoyed it. And yeah, we were so honored to have you join us. This was just a fantastic um, little show of your work and wonderful to speak with you and, and hear about it. Um, maybe as a closing, we can, as we're, after we end, we can just show these creatures again per request in the okay. chat. Um, it's only a minute. We can sort of close it out with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. It's, it's such a variety yeah. of stuff. Wonderful. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Everybody support Media Burn. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't it amazing that they can get up each morning? That they can actually drive cars, go to the supermarket, read street signs, operate appliances, vote in elections, blow their children's noses. These creatures with teeth that tear flesh, mouths that make sounds, isn't it amazing that we allow them to live among us, these creatures that we can and do control? What secrets do they possess? What allows them to function without violence?
Are they secretly violent? Okay, bye everyone. Thanks again.